Hey, what's up, everyone? So this won't describe all of you, but if you're anything like me, you've had a thought process going on in your head for a while now. And what it looks like is basically asking various forms of the question, what's going on with the left? And you're asking that question because recent events have been making you reevaluate things. And they've been making you feel like you've been missing something. But you also intuit that what you've been seeing isn't necessarily anything new, and looking back in the past could possibly shed some light on it. But when you go back to look in the past, you have a timeline in your head that looks something like this. You might know that back here it was mostly economics and working class stuff, but mostly it was so long ago that you don't really care about it. Then there's a gap here where you feel like not much happened. And then here you've got the civil rights movement, the Vietnam War, Malcolm X, and a lot of other stuff. Then there's another gap, apartheid here, some political correctness, Rodney King riots. Then there's another gap, and then you're in the present. But you really feel like you're missing something important back here. And the details of it seem like they might be affecting what's going on today. Well, anyway, not too long ago, those are my thoughts. And it led me down a path of research where I ended up focusing on not all of 60s activists, but on a specific subset of 60s radicals called the New Left. And after spending a few months with the New Left, I think I'll be able to talk about them in a way that brings some clarity to the puzzle of modern leftist politics. And that being said, I don't know about you, but I'm ready to start saying some words that are not introduction words. Okay, so you have to know a little bit about what the major political ideas were going into the 60s. And the way people normally cover this section is by pointing at this book, which came out originally in 1960 and covered the exhaustion of political ideas in the 50s. And the book basically said, it's been a great run, but all the major radical ideas have already been tried. And there was this emerging consensus that we had an ideological winner, at least in America and Western civilization. And that ideological winner was liberalism. So if you wanted for some reason to critique society at the time, it was normal to refer to it as liberal society. By liberal society, people meant a society that is based on trying to see each other as individuals and not as members of some sort of um, collective or special interest group. So it could be skin color. Um, that's probably the most common one that people talk about, um, but it could be any kind of identity difference that normally divides people up in a tribal way. So liberalism is trying to see past that and is trying to bring people together in one big human family and see everyone within that family as individuals. And then it tries to encourage all those people to develop into their own best selves, where they have their own goals and their own beliefs in their head. And on top of that, it's a society based on freedom, um, cooperation, and civility. This had already been modified from the original version of liberalism, which we now call classical liberalism. But this is what people meant at the time when they're talking about liberal society and liberal principles. Going back to this book, the author specifically named an ideology that he felt had run its course and could be thought of as exhausted. And that ideology was Marxism. That didn't go over well with various types of Marxists at the time. And the 60s was basically a period where they responded to that. And before they did, they made three major changes to their versions of Marxism. The first major change was to distance themselves from the Soviet Union and Soviet Marxism, which they now called vulgar Marxism. The second major change was they stopped trying to make a revolution through the proletariat and instead shifted their focus to young intellectuals, which as it turned out was mostly um, college students. And the third major change was that they expanded their ideas away from class, but mostly not totally dropping it, and into the realm of culture. So you can find all these changes in a letter by C. Wright Mills that he wrote to young intellectuals at the time, where he gave a name to the movement, which he called the New Left. So the New Left was a period where this new type of Marxism was developed, and where it became popular, and where it interacted with other existing ideas at the time. So this happened in four major movements. Three of them were based on identity, and one was just called the student movement or student radicals. They weren't part of any identity group that brought them together, besides, I guess, being students. And they mostly focused on elites oppressing the masses through the lens of power and authority. An important thing to understand is that the new left wasn't operating in a political vacuum at the time. 
there was this widespread feeling that liberal America had been falling short of its own principles and that too many people had been patting themselves on the backs for having made this free and equal society. But for too many people in that society, things weren't free and equal. So I think the civil rights movement was like a powder keg that popularized that type of critique. And that made lots of different types of people want to get involved and make their own movements. So this sort of shared critique of liberal America brought lots of different types of people together. But then from there, opinions split roughly into two camps. One of those camps wanted reform. These people wanted to live in a society that was actually free and equal for everyone, not a society that slanted power towards certain demographics while putting its thumb on others. So they basically thought liberal society was falling short of its own principles and that it needed some tweaks in order to fix that and create a happier, more inclusive society. They were referred to as the liberal left. You can generally tell if a movement is a liberal left movement if they have the word rights attached to it. Their goal is to get equal rights and equal treatment and then assimilate back into liberal society when they're done. And the other camp wanted revolution. They basically looked around America and saw society as fundamentally rotten. The problems of America went so deep that America as we know it was unsalvageable. And they basically wanted to break it apart and make a new America with new principles. Not just any principles, but principles that agreed with Marxism. So you had two major goals within the radical left, reform and revolution. And these goals are mutually exclusive. So you can only do one or the other. So the new left activists were mostly over in this revolution camp. And the story of the new left is the story of their influence in this broader debate happening between reform and revolution. But there was a lot of messiness because people didn't necessarily stick with one side or the other. And a lot of people kind of floated in this gray area in between. And on top of that, a lot of these movements didn't stick with being reformist or revolutionary movements. And they tended to sort of um, shift between these goalposts over time. So I think the best way to understand the new left and understand their influence in the 60s is to study them in this broader conversation between reform or revolution and look at the influence they had in it. By the way, I know I'm throwing a lot at you right now and you might be a little confused, but I'm gonna go through these movements one at a time. And I think the more I talk about it, the clearer it'll be. Starting here, we conveniently have a sharp example of the reform or revolution dynamic playing out within the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, which apparently everyone called SNCC, which was by far the biggest, most influential black student radical group of the 60s. SNCC started all the way over on the reformist end of the spectrum in the early 60s under the influence of the civil rights movement, and notably from the influence of this man, whose name I hope I don't have to show on the screen. And that influence pushed SNCC towards nonviolence, which is in its name, and towards racial integration and assimilation-based goals. So that influence shaped SNCC's outlook and political activity in the early 60s, which they mostly spent in the South, working on voter registration and busing reform. But meanwhile, there was another influence brewing in SNCC, and that influence is normally attributed to this man, Stokely Carmichael. We are gonna talk about Stokely Carmichael in a second, but I think the best way to start with him is to look at what's thought to be his biggest influence, which is Franz Fanon's The Wretched of the Earth. Wretched of the Earth basically says we need to expand our existing class-based Marxist thinking to include race in our analysis because rich people are able to become rich because they're white. He makes his argument in imperialist terms, framing white people as colonialist oppressors and black people as colonized oppressed. He rejects liberal values and opts for separation using the term decolonization and says decolonization is necessarily violent. By the way, these terms are absolutely appropriate because he's talking about the relationship between Europe and Africa. Stokely Carmichael is the main person credited for taking these critiques and placing them in an American framework. In a book that he co-wrote that outlines the Black Power Movement, he says that white Americans oppress black Americans through institutional racism, which is pretty similar to our modern idea of systemic racism. And he rejects liberal values because he's connecting liberal values with whiteness with white America and says when black Americans assimilate into white America, they essentially lose touch with their black identity. So instead, he says black Americans should rally around their black identity and get back in touch with Africa if they can, and then stand within white society as a powerful collective while rejecting its racist institutions and values. So with SNCC, we have these two conflicting influences, 
one starting them here, and one pulling them over here. That being said, I think it's time to complicate this a little bit more and add in a middle category. Because judging from the quote from the Black Power book, he made it sound like he was trying to make some sort of compromise between reform and revolution when he said that before black Americans should join white society, they should close ranks and then join society as a tight-knit group. He's not saying that he wants to radically change society, although he does hint at it, but he also doesn't want to fully assimilate into it either, at least as individuals that don't associate with their identity group. So he says he wants to exist in liberal society as a united black coalition, not fully separating from society, but also not necessarily starting a revolution that overthrows liberalism. But those are just some quotes from one book. And I think where the black power movement stands exactly depends on who you ask and when. If you look at other quotes, even from Stokely Carmichael, like this afterward, which he wrote in a different name in the early 90s, he says that he doesn't advocate revolution, only reform. So you might say, okay, so we're over here. But then on the next page, he says, the reforms advocated in the book will not avoid revolution. Rather, they will help advance the African revolution and consequently the world socialist revolution. Also, if you look at Stokely Carmichael's speeches from the 60s and the early 70s, he consistently pushes for this black-led anti-capitalist revolution. So, I don't know, it's messy. And if you ask different people what black power means and what the movement wanted, I'm sure you'd get different answers. And that's kind of the point, is that this is a time period where two different rough types of thinking were brought together based on this common feeling that liberal America wasn't doing enough and needed some kind of change. And then from there, it became hard to parse out exactly what people thought and what their exact goals were. Getting back to SNCC, you can watch these two major influences play out over the years within the organization. So SNCC started as a liberal organization in the early 60s. And by the mid-60s, it had already shifted towards this Marxist direction, which was marked by increasingly bitter ideological division within SNCC, as some people challenged nonviolence and wanted to racially segregate the movement. And by 1966, Stokely Carmichael took over as the new chairman of SNCC. SNCC had started as a student offshoot of the civil rights movement, but these new developments were now causing tension between SNCC and the civil rights movement. And while the two organizations were on a campaign together, Stokely Carmichael got up on a stage and shouted, Black Power, which is seen as the moment that made the Black Power slogan popular and launched the movement. Martin Luther King was worried that Black Power didn't represent the principles of the Civil Rights Movement, and he was worried about the press seeing that there was a division happening within the Civil Rights Movement. So he took Stokely Carmichael aside and basically said, hey, can we cut out that Black Power stuff? We're trying to use more peaceful and inclusive slogans like Freedom Now. And Stokely was like, no, people like my slogan. I'm going to keep saying black power. And they basically agreed to disagree, making an agreement not to say either slogan while they're marching together. So the public doesn't notice the tension within the civil rights movement and SNCC. A year later, in 1967, leadership changed again to this man who formed an alliance with the Black Panther Party. If anyone isn't familiar with the Black Panthers, they're basically a Marxist defensive missionary group that tries to defend its communities while doing charity work and occasionally plugging ideology about the revolution as they go. So if you don't believe me that they're a Marxist group, you can listen to their leadership do interviews because they're very candid about it, or you could take Stokely's word for it. The Black Panther Party was a Marxist-Leninist party. Its priority was the conversion of America through revolutionary means into a socialist society. SNCC, Black Power, and the Black Panthers were already associated with each other before that. But still, it was controversial for SNCC to officially ally with the Black Panthers. And on top of that, SNCC finally fully committed to racial segregation, asking their white membership to leave the organization. And they also endorsed violence, which meant that they had to change their name to take the word nonviolence out. And SNCC collapsed shortly after that. So to sum it up, kind of incredibly, within a decade, conflicting influences made SNCC go from being a nonviolent, inclusive, integrationist movement to being a racially exclusive movement whose leader went around the country saying violence is as American as cherry pie. So you might be wondering how SNCC exactly fits in with the new left. And the short answer is that it's controversial and anything I say will have some people disagreeing with it. Everyone agrees that the student radicals are the new left, but even those people, when they talk about it, will sometimes fit in SNCC activists if they were Marxists 
um, being active on college campuses. And to me, that distinction doesn't really make sense. And other people say the Black Panthers are part of the new left, but not SNCC. Um, but to me, if you were getting away from Soviet Marxism and instead involved in a movement that was adapting Marxism into culture, and it was somehow related with these college campus movements, you were part of the new left. So for me, that's the Black Panthers, that's a Black Power movement, and that's some people within SNCC. And you could even say maybe even SNCC after 1966 um, when Stokely Carmichael took over. But even that, like, um, it's kind of iffy. So hopefully that's making things more clear. I think for now the best thing to do is to keep on moving forward and to talk about the world of feminism. In the 1960s, second wave feminism was starting up. And again, there was this common element that brought different types of people together. And I think what that common element was, was this identification of men's domination of women and these kind of demeaning, condescending attitudes men had just generally towards women. So women felt like second-class citizens compared to men. And they felt that it was time to spread awareness of it and do something about it. But then again, from there, opinions on what exactly to do about it among feminists were split. Basically, if you looked at men and you saw them as human beings who you wanted to share society with equally, and your activism was an attempt to bridge gaps between the genders and live together respectfully as human beings with de-emphasized identity differences, then you were a liberal reformist. On the other hand, if you looked at men and you saw them as being the enemy, who had ran society tyrannically for a long time at women's expense. And now you thought it was a time for a changing of the guard where women were supposed to take power and maybe even take society away from men, then you were probably somewhere over here. These books are thought to be the two biggest influences on second wave feminism. The Second Sex by Simone de Beauvoir, I'm sorry for French speakers, and The Feminine Mystique by Betty Friedan. They both made very rough, kind of similar critiques where the feminine mystique said that American women are essentially second-class citizens because they default to marriage and being a housewife as their life goals. And the second sex basically spent 700 pages establishing that women have been a secondary gender to men across the course of human history. From there, they had different takes on the problem. The second sex comes from more of a Marxist Hegelian framework where she sees oppression as necessarily creating the conditions for war, and more specifically, the conditions for the war between the sexes. And part of her solution requires women to come together as some sort of um, proletarian we. And from there, they need to revolutionize society and make it equal in the ways that the Soviet Union promised. Then once those conditions are met, women can undergo an inner metamorphosis that will make them truly free. The feminine mystique doesn't see the problem in terms of a battle of the sexes between men and women. Instead, she tries to empower women as individuals and encourages them to take advantage of the rights won by earlier feminists and specifically frames the problem through the lens of work and marriage. She wants women to look outside of being a housewife as being a major life goal and instead look to the workforce and try to define their lives through meaningful work where they enter the workforce as equals to men. New left feminists may have been influenced by the feminine mystique by some of the more extreme arguments the book made about the oppression of women in America, most infamously comparing housewives to inmates in concentration camps. And the second sex, I think, was influential for taking gender and placing it in this Marxist kind of Hegelian framework. But the second sex went on to make very complicated arguments about redefining our relationship with gender and redefining femininity that I didn't see in New Left Feminism. And the feminine mystique went on to make liberal claims, as I said, that I also didn't see in New Left Feminism. So I do think these books were influential, but I'm not going to say anything more about either of them because I didn't see that direct of an influence from either of them in New Left Feminism. But I will talk more about Betty Friedan because she ended up being probably the most important figure of second wave feminism. Betty Friedan founded and led the biggest women's organization of second wave feminism called the National Organization for Women, which people called NOW. She ended up leading the organization in a decidedly liberal direction, trying to pursue equality between the genders and actually taking those goals so far that she made other women uncomfortable with the Equal Rights Amendment, which would have, among other things, 
made women equally susceptible to the military draft and equally considered for dangerous military roles. So the Equal Rights Amendment didn't pass, but it wasn't because of men. A conservative woman stopped it. But that's another story. So the biggest women's organization at the time, the National Organization for Women, fell decidedly in the liberal reformist camp. So they weren't part of the New Left, and neither is Betty Friedan. But there were still New Left feminists within Now, the most notable probably being T. Grace Atkinson, who spent some time in Now, but left it after she felt she wasn't able to influence the organization enough. She went on to form her own organization called The Feminists, with an optional aggressive subtitle. To get a sense of what their beliefs were, let's take a look at what I think is T. Grace Atkinson's most famous manifesto, Radical Feminism. It starts by responding to a piece of criticism, that feminism doesn't have an enemy. But to her, that's not good. That's a problem. She resolves that problem by saying, if women are the oppressed class, there's only one half of society left to be doing the oppressing, which is men. She says men are insecure, and to feel better about themselves, they demoralize and then dominate women, a process she calls metaphysical cannibalism. Women, who for some reason love these men, she basically says have Stockholm Syndrome. Here she says men and society are synonymous, which I think implies both men and society are the enemy. She says the battle of the sexes has been going on for a long time, except it's not really a battle, it's more of a massacre because the balance of power is so one-sided. And to stop that massacre, women need to fight back and hopefully negotiate in the very far future, and maybe then there will finally be peace. And then she goes on to use military terminology to go over battle plans. It looks like she's actually calling for something maybe over in the middle of the spectrum here. She did, I think, establish that society is the enemy, but she never said that she wanted to overthrow society or make a new one. And she did say that she wanted to negotiate as a collective. So I think that puts her somewhere in the middle here, but it's not totally clear. There's plenty more where this came from, though. And a lot of new left feminists were calling for some sort of full-fledged type of revolution and explicitly used Marx and Marxist terminology as their basis for doing it. So you had these two different camps of feminists at the time. You had the new left types of Marxist feminists, and you had the liberal left feminists like um, Betty Friedan. And I think that they sort of messily coexisted um, and tried to collaborate for the sake of trying to further feminism. And I think doing that led to ideological tensions between the groups. Like at this feminist conference in Ann Arbor, where a liberal House representative was speaking who had campaigned for Now's Equal Rights Amendment. Radical protesters came up to the stage and took the microphone away from the House representative. Then there was chaos, people left, and the next speaker was a new left feminist who said, I refuse to work with men anymore, and I don't hide it. And she could support women who are fighting alongside men, but there will come a day where it will be impossible to do both. So here we have gender segregation, that's happening as the movement is becoming more extreme, um, similar to the racial segregation that we saw in SNCC. When another student radical there was asked why they had taken the microphone away from the House representative, she said it was because the talks were oppressive. Why were the talks oppressive? Because speakers at the event were posturing themselves as experts on oppression, which she thought was oppressive and gave them a mandate to stop it. I was actually just cutting this part together and noticed this part of the article and thought I would point out just to show you that I'm not making up these terms, and this is a real conversation that people were having at the time. Anyway, the activist went on to point out more oppression going on, the inherent oppression of a speaker being up on a stage while listeners sat down below. I should plug here that a lot of new left thinking at the time revolved around critiquing social hierarchies. They thought social hierarchies were oppressive, and a lot of what they advocated for was to get rid of them. So for example, they were trying to switch America to a direct democracy instead of the representative democracy that we have now. And their organizations tended to try to reflect that. So they tended to have this kind of decentralized leaderless quality to them. From what I saw, it didn't really work. Maybe it worked for a while, but over time, leaders would sort of naturally crop up or people would see the power vacuum and take advantage of it. Over on the liberal side, they did critique hierarchies but only if those hierarchies interfered with equality of opportunity. So they wanted people to have equal opportunity to pursue what they wanted to pursue and not be discriminated based on their identity traits. 
But besides that, they were all four hierarchies. They said, as long as everyone has an equal shot, we should let leaders and bosses develop. So to wrap up feminism, they had both liberal reformist feminists and new left types of Marxist feminists, both within second wave feminism. But the most important organization now stayed decidedly liberal the whole time. But there were still organizations within second wave feminism that were um, more heavily influenced by the new left feminists. And it seems to me like they tended to become increasingly extreme and kind of spiral out of control over time. For legal reasons, I can't play video from it, but this documentary talked about increasing extremism within the women's liberation movement. And it all revolved around treating men as the enemy. So one day they would say that sleeping with men is sleeping with the enemy. So they would pressure women to not sleep with men. And then they would go even further, pressuring women to have sex with other women as an act of liberation. I think the most extreme example I saw was when one chapter one day announced that they would no longer allow babies into their office if those babies were male. So if you were a woman carrying a male child with you, you wouldn't be allowed into this office because you'd be carrying a little enemy. I feel like I should put a little disclaimer here that that type of extremism doesn't represent second wave feminism on the whole. I think second wave feminists kind of get a bad rap because that type of behavior was happening at the time and it would kind of get a lot of attention and blow up and get associated with the whole thing. But reading through their writings, I really got the opposite impression. It seemed like every time a feminist was talking about it, it was in the context of how much they disapproved of it or how it made them question the movement or made them want to leave the movement because they just didn't want to be associated with a movement where that type of thing was happening. So when we're talking about it, we're really just talking about a specific subset of radicals. And not only that, but later years of these new left radicals. And even among them, it was pretty controversial once it got to be that extreme. So I think it's a fair categorization of late new left feminism, but not at all a fair categorization of second wave feminism. So I don't know if that needs saying, but there it is. Okay, moving on along to the gay liberation movement. Not to be a broken record, but the gay liberation movement featured a similar type of dynamic where you had the liberal left being brought together with the revolutionary left. And they were brought together by this common critique that if you weren't straight in America, you were essentially a second class citizen, which I think was best embodied by a gay man trying to talk about these issues on TV who made the decision to hide his face during the interview behind a bush. If liberal America was actually equal for everybody, then this should be an incomprehensible decision. I think it's still a bit of a strange decision, but the, the idea of hiding your identity because you're not straight, I think is very understandable at the time because it was risque. So the gay liberation movement, more than anything, was an attempt to reverse that. But then as you try to get more specific about the details of it and the goals, again, things split where the liberal left wanted to focus on respect and visibility and passing legislation. And the revolutionary left wanted to focus on um, unleashing what they felt was trapped sexual potential. And they thought that within everyone, we had a more diverse set of sexual possibility and heteronormative society was essentially oppressing us by trapping that sexual possibility and forcing us into these boxes where we felt we had to be straight, which was mostly influenced by this book. Funnily enough, I think I found a good example of the tension between these liberal left ideas and these new left Marxist ideas within a single document, which I think is the biggest manifesto of the gay liberation movement, which is called the Gay Manifesto. It starts on a somewhat Marxist note, establishing group oppression and connecting it with society and then addresses the limitation of individual white male middle class consciousness in favor of a emerging group consciousness around being gay. And then they talk about only needing to see the world through the lens of sexual identity until oppression is ended, which implies de-emphasizing identity differences at that point. That might seem like a subtle point, but among New Left writing, this really stood out. Talking about eventual diplomacy and peace isn't new, but from everything I read, I never saw anyone else ever even speculate that they might be able to, at some point, de-emphasize their identity differences. It was also the most empathetic of the manifestos I read. So for example, here they invited straight people to read and understand what their issues were, 
which was a type of semi-friendly olive branch extending type of gesture towards their oppressor that I didn't see anywhere else. Although the author does take jabs at straight sex here, but we can ignore that. You have to remember that we're mostly dealing with student activists here and a lot of them are like 21 years old. And here they talk about the tensions between the black liberation movement and the gay liberation movement, but they empathize with the position of black Americans and say, despite their issues, gay Americans should support the black liberation movement. I'll say I did see other attempts at sort of coalition building between different groups, but it was never in the context of also saying, we're having these problems, let's make a coalition anyway. Then they say society is rotten and that they're basically not interested in becoming an equal part of it, which makes them seem like they're firmly over in the revolution camp. But then they also reject being labeled as Marxist or communist and basically say they're kind of in limbo figuring it out and have problems with also socialism and capitalism. So after reading this manifesto, I wasn't quite sure what to think. The only thing that seemed clear to me was that the author seemed like they had a mix of influences, probably between the liberal left and the Marxist new left, and didn't seem like they wanted to commit that much to either one. And beyond that, wasn't quite sure where they sat and was just sort of picking and choosing values and putting them together in a way that didn't quite seem cohesive to me. But beyond that, I didn't really know what to think. But then I noticed some attached comments on the copy I had from a socialist group within the gay liberation movement. And they had a couple suggestions that would um, tweak the document more in their liking. Correction one basically said that the manifesto focused too much on personal liberation and personal consciousness. And they instead think they should focus more on collective liberation and collective consciousness. Correction 2 noted how the manifesto said that the gay liberation movement wasn't Marxist or socialist, when, at least according to the Red Butterfly, the gay liberation movement is Marxist and socialist. And then they talk about their vision for a Marxist society. I think this little disagreement is probably the most new left thing I've shown you guys so far. Everyone agreed that they want to adapt Marx to some extent, but some people wanted to use him in a more hybridized way, and some people wanted to take a more hardline Marxist position with the eventual goal of implementing socialism. So I think more than anything, the new left was a time where people were searching for new ideas and everyone had the common ground of adapting Marx and using it to define their group oppression and critique society. But beyond that, really disagreement categorized the new left more than they kind of agreed upon set of goals or values. It looks like disagreement also categorized the biggest organization of the gay liberation movement called the Gay Liberation Front which formed pretty late in the timeline of the New Left, in 1969, after some riots at the Stonewall Inn in New York City. Their 1970 Statement of Purpose reads vaguely Marxist to me, but pretty toned down. I think they were a pretty Marxist movement, though, because they allied with the Black Panthers. And within a year of them forming, two members said they were sick of the lack of hierarchies and all of this focus on revolutionary doctrine. And they left to create a new organization with hierarchies that could focus on individual gay rights issues. This new organization, the Gay Activist Alliance, dedicated itself to liberal reform while rejecting violence and otherwise unrelated ideologies. The Gay Activist Alliance went on to be successful, and the Gay Liberation Front broke up shortly after. Of the four major New Left movements, the Gay Liberation Movement was by far the shortest lived, and the liberal and Marxist elements within it quickly split and went separate ways. And the Marxist element, I think, didn't go on to be very prominent in gay activism um, going forward after that. So I think that's why it seems strange, at least to me, to associate Marxism with gay activism, because I think the most prominent um, movements coming out of this period ended up being liberal. Okay, last but not least, the student radicals. If people are talking about this time period and they vaguely reference the students or student radicals, and they don't explicitly mention any of these other movements that we talked about so far, then you can safely bet that they're talking about the Students for a Democratic Society, which was by far the largest student organization at the time, which people abbreviate down to SDS. The SDS was a bunch of Marxist student radicals whose enemy wasn't any one identity group. It was society itself. They looked at society in a very pessimistic way, seeing nothing but oppression through power imbalances. And they thought it was so bad that they basically didn't want to take part in society unless they could radically change it. So they were basically Edward Norton in the first 30 minutes of Fight Club. 
That pessimistic outlook, I think, came from two major influences. They are both Marxist writers concerned with power imbalances in society and the masses not having agency over that society. This book basically says that the masses don't have control over elites. So elites run society, which is oppressive to the masses and is essentially undemocratic. And this book basically says that the material comforts of modern capitalism brainwash people into a kind of one-dimensional sameness and keeps them from being able to imagine alternative Marxist societies. If you remember this guy from the letter that I referenced earlier in the video, he was the one that wanted to specifically target young intellectuals as a source for this new type of revolution. So these students heard that and felt like they were being spoken to and wanted to rise to the occasion. In their efforts to rise to the occasion, the SDS went on a pretty crazy journey, starting as a little organization to becoming the biggest organization on the left by far, and probably playing a role in ending the Vietnam War, to collapsing back down to a tiny domestic terrorist unit, and all that was within a decade. Out of all the movements we've talked about, the student radicals are by far the trickiest to categorize. In my opinion, they started all the way over here, and stayed over there throughout the 60s. But that's going to be controversial, and I think some people within the SDS, if they heard that, would disagree with it. So to show you why they're tricky to categorize, let's take a look at their first movement, the free speech movement. Free speech is basically the poster child of liberal causes. It was introduced by liberalism, and that's what made it into the American value that we recognize now. So if you saw a movement loudly proclaiming itself as the free speech movement, you would think it would come from an organization that was a liberal organization. But it's not that simple. The free speech movement is widely considered to not actually be about free speech. It's thought that the SDS used the issue of free speech to manipulate other students and consolidate power against their college administrators. To show you what I'm talking about, here's the leader of the free speech movement giving his famous speech from it. There's a time when the operation of the machine becomes so odious, makes you so sick at heart that you can't take part you can't even passively take part. And you've got to put your bodies upon the gears and upon the wheels, upon the levers, upon all the apparatus, and you've got to make it stop. And you've got to indicate to the people who run it, to the people who own it, that unless you're free, the machine will be prevented from working at all. This is 1964, so this is pretty early in the SDS and the New Left timeline. And this is Berkeley he's talking about. And he's urging people to throw their bodies into the gears of the university machine. So based on what you just saw, what type of grievance do you think he was talking about that got him so worked up? If you guessed that the campus wouldn't let them set up tables for political activity on one strip of sidewalk on the campus, you guessed right. So yeah, they took one of the freest, most privileged places on earth, Berkeley campus, and presented it as if it were apartheid all over again. And if you read their writing about it, they barely mention free speech, and instead they spend most of their time talking about how oppressive America is, and how oppressive the university system is, and frame their administrators as tyrants. My point is that you can't necessarily take what they seemed to be at face value, and it seemed clear to me that there was at least some amount of manipulation going on, and that they had other agendas that they weren't upfront about. And asking them questions directly wouldn't necessarily clear anything up either. So to give you a sense of how slippery they can be, here's a clip from an interview with one of the big SDS leaders asking about activities on the Columbia campus. Is SDS, Mark, really interested in Columbia, or is it just a stepping stone? Uh, are you concerned with something much bigger than Columbia? Why did you use Columbia, or did you use Columbia? I say that, that neither is true, or both are true. So what it is is a, a, um, a, a training ground, or, or not only a training ground, but one, one that has immediate relevance. If we look at their 1962 constitution, we can say that they were socialists because their organization was formed from this earlier socialist organization. And we can say that they wanted to build some sort of coalition on the left while distancing themselves from Soviet communism. But beyond that, it's hard to say. A coalition for what? In their most famous piece of early writing, it starts with boilerplate criticism of America, and then some contradictions in liberalism, and then says, mankind desperately needs revolutionary leadership in order to change the conditions of humanity in the late 20th century. 
they say they want to distance themselves from Stalinism. And besides that, they just say they want to switch to a direct democracy from the representative one we have now. And they say they wanted to socialize the economy. So this does tell you something, but not that much that distinguishes them from a normal socialist group, which I guess could be because they just hadn't figured it out at that point. But I'm just saying this document doesn't really help that much either. The SDS went on to take official positions against the Vietnam War and racism in America. But again, I think it's tricky to say how sincere they were about either of those causes because it seems to me like they used those causes because they served the thesis that America was rotten and needed their revolutionary leadership to save it. This is just one quote from the leader of the free speech movement, but in my experience, this is typical of how they framed those issues. The issues themselves were indicators of systemic rot, which makes it seem to me at least that they used those issues as a lightning rod to start a revolution in America. I'm also confident of being skeptical about them because a philosophy professor that was close to the movement wrote a book that went into detail about how manipulative the SDS could be. So for example, if they wanted to make themselves more sympathetic in the eyes of other students and faculty, and they wanted to make administrators into tyrants, they knew that the presence of police on campus would optically work in their favor. So they would do some kind of large scale illegal demonstration like taking over a college building and barricading it from within. Apparently sometimes calling television crews first and telling them where and when to show up. Then the demonstration happens and it just becomes a question of whether or not the administrators take the bait and call the police. If they don't and find a way to resolve it peacefully and internally, the students just learn that they need to be more extreme next time and maybe use violence. At some point, the administrators will probably feel like they have to call the police. And when they do that, it'll turn sympathy over to the side of the students because other students don't know that all this has been going on. And they just see the optics of police on campus arresting students. And it works to bring sympathy to the students and turn people against the administrators. From what I read, it seemed like that kind of behavior stunned people at the time. And they weren't quite sure how to deal with it. I think people had a certain amount of assumed civility where if you had disagreements with someone, it was assumed that you'd be able to sit down and peacefully talk them out. But if people aren't upfront about what they want, and if they're using these kinds of tactics to turn the public against you and discredit you in ways that aren't honest, it all kind of starts to fall apart. And in my opinion, that was kind of the point. Luckily, they published some documents in the 2000s that were written in the mid 60s and shed some light on it. There's an editor's note here that says that the early SDS did seem to be democratic socialists, which means that they were trying to implement socialism through democratic processes. So in the first few years, they may have genuinely been just a normal socialist organization. But starting in the mid 60s, apparently they took more of a turn towards revolutionary Marxism. Their take on being revolutionary Marxist was to develop this new left into a position where they'd be able to transform America into a full-blown communist society. Glancing through what they wrote, I think what they mean by this is the communal ownership of everything. It could be media, it could be property, everything. So this is published in 1967. And at that point, apparently they had committed to more of a hardline communist position where they're trying to do a total social and political transformation to get there. There's a notable part in this document too, where they talk about the need to develop radical consciousness among a large number of students. And then there's this, if there's a single overall purpose for the student power movement, it would be the development of a radical political consciousness among those students who will later hold jobs in strategic sectors of the political economy. That quote was in the context of a document that was laying down strategies on how to accumulate power on campus. So they're trying to get power on campus in order to activate this Marxist radical consciousness among a bunch of students who will then go on to hold important jobs in the political economy, which will facilitate the um, eventual transition into communism. So it doesn't seem like liberalism ever had much of a shot in the SDS. It looks like they started over here, trying to revolutionize America into becoming a socialist country through democratic means. And from there, they became more revolutionary as they became more ambitious for their plans of the future of America. After the SDS took a position against the Vietnam War, their membership exploded and by 1968 hit around 100,000 people, 
which might seem crazy after everything I just said. Um, but I think of the new members, probably very few of them were aware of the true nature of the organization they were joining and probably just wanted to simply protest the Vietnam War. But either way, I think their exploding popularity and prominence gave the SDS membership um, confidence that they could embrace a more openly Marxist position. Because by 1969, their convention had turned into basically an all-out power struggle between three Marxist factions who argued over who had the true form of Marxism and the right plan for the revolutionary uprising. Civility had broken down, Free speech was going out the window, and the concept of democracy went out with it. A minority group was afraid of losing power to a majority group of Maoists, so the minority group got together and somehow voted to expel the majority, who otherwise would have probably won the convention. And yes, this happened at a convention for the students for a democratic society. The quote-unquote winners went on to pledge support for Marxist groups and regimes around the world and then urged the people of the world to come together and take up arms against the brutal oppression of America. The SDS lost more than 99% of the membership that year, starting from around 100,000 in 1968 down to around 500 in 1969, who were mostly left in this little group that was made by remaining SDS leaders called Weathermen. And the Weathermen are kind of only sort of related to the point that I'm making for this video. But I'll finish out their story quickly um, because they're pretty interesting. So this is a statement of purpose that was written by a core group of SDS leaders. And reading through it, you can really tell how far off the rails they've gone. They say they're concerned with the contradiction between revolutionary people around the world and US imperialism and encourage people to question their own relationship with those things. Then say that their task is the creation of a mass revolutionary movement akin to the Red Guard in China, meaning that it's a movement with a full willingness to participate in the violent and illegal struggle, which is part of a world strategy for winning the revolution, which builds a movement oriented towards power and will become one division of the International Liberation Army, while its battlefields are added to the many Vietnams, which will dismember and dispose of US imperialism. Long live the victory of the People's War. This little remainder group of the SDS, called the Weathermen, tried to start a populist uprising against America with their days of rage, but it didn't really work and turnout was low and their membership collapsed from 500 down to 200, at which point they felt the best thing to do was to break that apart and reform as a secretive little domestic terrorist group called the Weather Underground. And the Weather Underground started on a domestic bombing campaign focusing on police and military targets. The public statements that I've seen from Weather Underground members, including this documentary, typically frame their bombing as anti-war efforts, but that doesn't really square with their own writing. And this is why it's important to read this stuff, because then you can hold them accountable to their own statements that they signed off on. They said they were trying to start a bigger world war, the People's War. Even if they were trying to end the war in Vietnam, it wasn't in the best interest of Americans or the Vietnamese. They're rooting for the North Vietnamese dictator in that war, and they're rooting against America. They were urging the North Vietnamese to dismember and dispose of US imperialism so a Marxist dictator could liberate Vietnam. If you've never heard of the Weather Underground before, and you're wondering why, it's probably because they never killed anyone. Their first three attempts would have all killed people, but for various reasons, their first three bombing attempts failed. And after that, they had a change of heart and decided to switch to bombing empty buildings. So they did have a long bombing campaign where they successfully bombed empty buildings. But the revolution never started. And after a while, they eventually gave up and turned themselves in. And I think that's a fair spot to peg the end of the new left. I'm guessing for most of you that this portrayal of 60s radicals is different than what you've heard before. And as we wrap things up, that's one of the major um, kind of open-ended questions I want to ask is why isn't this time period taught accurately? Because I think this is really important stuff. I think this played a really big role in shaping American politics going forward. And it seems like we have kind of a big blind spot for it. Some of it might really be laziness and oversimplification. So I think a lot of people that talk about this time period kind of just lump all the 60s radicals together as anti-war or anti-racist or whatever. 
And don't take the time to parse out that these were really very different groups that were doing this stuff and had very different goals. But that can't be all of it because a lot of people that specifically talk about the new left do a lot of historical airbrushing where um, the name Karl Marx tends to not even get mentioned and a lot of the kind of unsavory bits kind of get left out. If you're suspecting that my coverage of the new left wasn't accurate and that I was cherry picking for extremism and pretending that it was a good um, representation of the whole thing. I get why you think that, but that really wasn't at all what I was doing. I spent the vast majority of the video um, trying to select for the most important and influential people and ideas and trying to give a sense of how they interacted with each other. I did intentionally leave quite a lot of historical detail out, like the 1968 DNC convention, which seemed really interesting, but I didn't see any new major people or ideas coming into play. So things like that were left out, and I think you can pretty easily find that stuff elsewhere. I think I did intentionally cherry pick once when I was talking about increasing extremism in the women's liberation movement and how they wouldn't let like male babies come into their office. But I thought I made it clear I was cherry picking there. And the vast majority of the video, I'm really just trying to give you a sense of the major movements and the major people and the major ideas. So I think we should be asking why we aren't covering this more often and more responsibly. Because I think this is a really important time period. And I think a lot of the ideas in play were actually quite dangerous. Um, like the Weather Underground, for example, were trying to target um, hundreds of police officers and civilians. And if they pulled that off, I think they would have triggered a massive authoritarian backlash from the government. And I think American history would be very different. So I think we kind of dodged a bullet with that time period. And I think we need to learn our lessons from it, because if we don't teach it responsibly, I think we're at risk for that kind of extremism bubbling back up. Okay, educational shortcomings aside, and granting me that that was um, acceptable coverage, you might say, okay, well, what do I take from it? That seemed like a really confusing time period. And to me, that's kind of the point. That time period was really confusing. And what was being confused in that time period? And I think the answer was liberalism and Marxism. Going into the 60s, we had clear ideas of what those two terms meant. Liberalism was seen as the default value of Americans, and Marxism meant that you were either a communist or a socialist. And at the time, Marxism hadn't been popularly tied in with identity politics or with critiques of power structures in America outside of economics. So I see the new left as the time period where cultural Marxism became popular. And became tangled with leftist identity politics and leftist versions of liberalism. And it was basically a decade where those ideas all got tangled together and produced a hybridized spectrum of opinion. I think this added complexity to leftist ideology. And between the lack of attention paid to it and the lack of education around it, leftist politics have become so confusing that people don't really understand the major ideologies in play anymore. And I think we're living with the consequences of it. So I hope this made a little bit more sense out of things for you. That being said, thanks for watching. If you can't tell, this was a pretty big effort of mine. So I appreciate you getting through it. And if you enjoyed it, stick around because there will be more coming in the future.